Well, hi there. So in this first video we're going to be doing is the first lecture of unit three supply and the theory of the firm. And so what that's going to entail is taking a look at something called the production function. And so in the production function, what we're really talking about is a relationship, just like demand is a relationship or supply is a relationship. The production function is a relationship. And in this case, it's the relationship of how we turn inputs into outputs. Um, the idea that we want to kind of generate product. And so what's kind of this combination of inputs that becomes outputs? In our, our microeconomics class that we're studying here, we're not really going to construct a production function directly, um, but we're going to be able to kind of describe it in a couple of ways. In order to understand kind of some of the basics of the production function, you first have to know that in there's this difference between what we call the short run and the long run. And in economic economics talking, uh, the lang language of it, short run doesn't mean a particular time frame. So it's not like one week or it's not like six months. What it refers to is a time period in which some of your inputs are variable. And that's the kind of term we would use to say that they could change in the quantity of them. But that be because of a short enough time period, some of your inputs are fixed. And let me kind of zoom in just a little bit here so you can kind of see um, what, what we're talking about here with this one. And so these fixed inputs are usually what we'd say usually are land and capital. Whoa, sorry about that. We're getting a new document camera. And so typically in the short run, we'd say land and capital. And that means like if you're running a restaurant, the amount of kind of space for your tables, the number of ovens and the refrigerator and all that stuff, that's kind of fixed in a, in a short run period. But you might be able to vary the number of waiters that you have and you could vary the number of hours that they work. And so we would say that those are the very input, but you have some fixed inputs. The existence of fixed inputs is actually what defines the short run. In all, all of the inputs are variable in the long run. So basically the long run refers to this time period where it's enough time where you could change the capacity of your facilities, of your plant, physical plant, um, not like, you know, plant that you're growing, but like you, you have enough time where you could maybe build a second building or expand out. Now, um, what we're going to do here is describe a couple of measures of product. And we know that first kind of thinking about the production function, the most basic one would just be relating the units of input, the number of labor that vary with the amount of total product that, that each one produces. But if we've got this total product function, we can actually create two additional functions that tell us more information um, that correspond to these various units of labor as well. And so marginal product, marginal, remember, that just means additional right? Additional. And in this context, the additional is referring to additional product, the output from each unit of labor. And so there's no marginal product for the zeroth unit, but there is a marginal product for the first unit, and it's the difference in the total product. And so we'd say three. Really, what this is, is the change in total product divided by the change in inputs. And so we could actually say, you know, what's the marginal product when you go from, say, the zeroth to the second unit? And that would be 10 total units. But typically when we're talking about marginal product, we're referring to the marginal product of each individual worker. And so for this next one, it's going to be the seven, right? It's just the change because we'd have change in input one, change in output seven. And then the rest of these, we're just going to kind of do quickly here, 14, 12, four, two. And then here you see we get zero marginal product for that worker. And then we actually lost some product when we hired the eighth worker. We can also calculate a value called the average product. And this kind of allows us to determine the average number of units that these workers are generating. So for the first worker, well, it's just three over one because that's the only worker we have. The second worker, 10 over two is five. 24 over three is eight. And then nine, eight, seven, six and five. And again, I'm just dividing this 40 over eight, 42 over seven, 42 over six and so forth. And so from this data table, you can kind of see if you start comparing these numbers a little bit, you start to see this relationship emerge that actually looks like this. You've got this upward kind of trajectory of total product and it, and it ends up kind of slowing down a little bit and then reaching a peak and then coming back down again. And we saw that here. You can see it's rapidly increasing and then it starts to slow down a little bit, reaches a peak here and then drops a little bit. Marginal product likewise has that kind of same procedure and it goes up and then back down again. And then average product you see 
um, a similar pattern emerge as well. And what we can see with these is that that would be a typical product function is that there are stages is what we would say, kind of stages of production where these emerge. And, and using these kind of dashed lines, they correspond to particular stages. There's the first stage would be where you get increasing marginal returns. And what that means is, is that every time you add an additional input, you actually get more and more output out of each additional input. The marginal product of each worker is actually greater than zero and it's growing, like it's getting bigger. So let's take a look in our data table up here. You can see it goes from three to seven, so it gets bigger, bigger even still to 14, and then it starts to drop again. So in this first stage, right, we would just say this is like stage one right here, is increasing marginal returns. And here in the table above, mark two dashed lines and label stages one, two, and three on the left. And so we could say, well, all the way up to do, 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 do here is stage one. And that's because, again, our marginal products are rising up until we get to that third worker. And maybe so it's better to actually say do, 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 all the way at the end of that third worker, right? With the fourth worker is actually where we would say stage two begins. And so stage two is what we call diminishing marginal returns. And this happens because you're continually adding more and more variable inputs, but you have a fixed amount of the other types of inputs. In other words, you could keep hiring more and more waiters for your restaurant, but at a certain point, there's not enough tables, there's not enough ovens, the kitchen is too small. And so you're not gonna get as much marginal product out of each one of those additional waiters and cooks that you hire. And so the marginal product of each additional one starts to fall. It has nothing to do with the quality of the individuals, it has everything to do with diminishing returns to that input. And it's because, again, you have a combination of some variable inputs, but the existence of fixed inputs is what's really making this happen. So this is a negative sloped MP, and that's that second stage. Again, continuing kind of to stage, whoops, stage two, right, where at this point, stage three, negative marginal returns start to set in. And we'll come back up to the top here and label up here as well. Here we can see that this last one, right, this last one is where we kind of stop getting any gains. And actually, you know, really the seventh worker we would say is kind of this break even point here actually. So we kind of say these workers, I keep having trouble writing the word stage, weird. Stage two are where you have this going from the 12th to the fourth to the second to the zeroth worker. That's where each additional worker is generating less marginal product than the one before. Um, and it's again, because this is zero, it's kind of like a, a, a point where they're kind of splitting between the two stages. Again, that third stage, negative marginal returns, it would actually be irrational to ever hire that worker. Um, it doesn't ever make sense to hire this eighth worker there, I wrote it correctly, stage three, um, because the eighth worker is actually costing us units of output. And that's that's an, that's not where you would ever want to be in terms of these production ranges. Um, you can also kind of make some other connections between kind of the maximum of total product. And you can see that that occurs where marginal product hits zero. That links up with a lot of other ideas that we've talked about in this class in terms of like marginal utility and total utility. Um, but you, you kind of get the idea here. Just so you know, this graph, you will never have to reproduce it, but you might see it in a multiple choice question. Hopefully this makes sense of just a little bit of the basics of how we turn inputs into outputs and how we kind of grapple with some of the measures of that. I'll see you next time. Take care.